Imperium. The Philosophy of History and Politics. Chapter 12. The Scientific Technical World Outlook. Science is the seeking after exact knowledge of phenomena. In discovering interrelations between phenomena, that is, observing the conditions of their appearance, it feels it has explained them. This type of mentality appears in a high culture after the completion of creative religious thought and the beginning of externalizing. In our culture, this type of thinking only began to feel sure of itself with the middle of the 17th century, in the classical, in the 5th century BC. The leading characteristic of early scientific thinking, from the historical standpoint, is that it dispenses with theological and philosophical equipment, only using them to fill in the background, in which it is not interested. It is thus materialistic, in its essence, in that its sole attention is turned to phenomena, and not to ultimate realities. To a religious age, phenomena are unimportant compared with the great spiritual truths. To a scientific age, the opposite is true. Technics is the utilization of the macrocosm. It always accompanies a science in its full blooming. But this is not to say that every science is accompanied by technical activity, for the sciences of the classical culture and the Mexican culture had nothing at all which we would call technical proficiency. In the early civilization stage, science predominates and precedes technics in all its attempts, but with the turn of the 20th century, technical thinking began to emancipate itself from this dependence, and in our day, science serves technics, and no longer vice versa. In an age of materialism, which is to say, an anti-metaphysical age, it was but natural that an anti-metaphysical type of thinking like science would become a popular religion. Religion is a necessity for culture man, and he will build his religion on economics, biology, or nature, if the spirit of the age excludes true religion. Science was the prevalent religion of the 18th and 19th centuries. While one was permitted to doubt the truths of Christian sects, one was not allowed to doubt Newton, Leibniz, and Descartes. When the great Goethe challenged the Newtonian light theory, he was put down as a crank and a heretic. Science was the supreme religion of the 19th century, and all other religions, like Darwinism and Marxism, referred to its great parent dogmas as the basis for their own truths. Unscientific became the term of damnation. From its timid beginnings, science finally took the step of holding out its results, not as a mere arrangement and classification, but as the true explanations of nature and life. With this step, it became a world outlook, that is, a comprehensive philosophy, with metaphysics, logic, and ethics for believers. Every science is a profane restatement of the preceding dogmas of the religious period. It is the same cultural soul which formed the great religions that in the next age reshapes its world, and this continuity is thus absolutely inevitable. Western science as a world outlook is merely Western religion represented as profane, not sacred, natural, not supernatural, discoverable, not revealed. Like Western religion, science was definitely priestly. The savant is the priest, the instructor is the lay brother, and a great systematizer is canonized, like Newton and Planck. Every Western thought form is esoteric, and its scientific doctrines were no exception. The populace were kept in touch with the advance of science through a popular literature at which the high priests of science smiled. In the 19th century, science accreted the progress idea and gave its own particular stamp to it. The content of progress was to be technical. Progress was to consist in faster motion, further sound, wider exploitation of the material world ad infinitum. This showed already the coming predominance of technics over science. Progress was not to be primarily more knowledge, but more technique. Every Western worldview strives after universality, and so this one declared that the solution of social problems was not to be found in politics and economics, but in science. Inventions were promised which would make war too horrible for men to engage in, and they would therefore cease warring. This naivete was a natural product of an age which was strong in natural science, but weak in psychology. The solution of the problem of poverty was machinery, and more machinery. 
the horrible conditions that had arisen out of a machine civilization were to be alleviated by more machines. The problem of old age was to be overcome by rejuvenation. Death was pronounced to be only a product of pathology, not of senility. If all diseases were done away with, there would be nothing left to die from. Racial problems were to be solved by eugenics. The birth of individuals was to be no longer left to fate. Scientific priests would decide things like parentage and birth. No outer events would be allowed in the new theocracy, nothing uncontrolled. The weather was to be harnessed, all natural forces brought under absolute control. There would be no occasion for wars. Everyone would be striving to be scientific, not seeking power. International problems would vanish, since the world would become one huge scientific unit. The picture was complete, and to the materialistic 19th century, awe-inspiring. All life, all death, all nature, reduced to absolute order in the custody of scientific theocrats. Everything would go on this planet just as it went in the picture of the heavens that the scientific astronomers had sketched out for themselves. Serene regularity would reign, but this order would be purely mechanical, utterly purposeless. Man would be scientific only in order to be scientific. Imperium Chapter 12, Section 2 Something happened, however, to disturb the picture and to show that it too bore the hallmark of life. Before the First World War, the disintegration of the psychical foundations of the great structure had already set in. The World War marks, in the realm of science, as in every other sphere of Western life, a seishura. A new world arose from that war. The spirit of the 20th century stood forth as the successor to the whole mechanistic view of the universe, and to the whole concept of the meaning of life, as being the acquisition of wealth. With truly amazing rapidity, considering the decades of its power and supremacy, the mechanistic view paled, and the leading minds, even within its disciplines, dropped away from the old, self-evident articles of materialistic faith. As is the usual case with historical movements, expressions of a superpersonal soul, the point of highest power, of the greatest victories, is also the beginning of the rapid downgoing. Shallow persons always mistake the end of a movement for the beginning of its absolute dominance. Thus, Wagner was looked upon by many as the beginning of a new music, whereas the next generation knew that he had been the last Western musician. The passing away of any expression of culture is a gradual process. Nevertheless, there are turning points, and the rapid decline of science as a world outlook set in with the First World War. The downgoing of science as a mental discipline had long preceded the World War. With the theory of entropy, 1850, and the introduction of the idea of irreversibility into its picture, science was on the road which was to culminate in physical relativity and frank admission of the subjectivity of physical concepts. From entropy came the introduction of statistical methods into systematic science, and the beginning of spiritual abdication. Statistics described life and the living. The strict tradition of Western science had insisted on exactitude in mathematical description of reality, and had hence despised that which was not susceptible of exact description, such as biology. The entrance of probabilities into formally exact science is the sign that the observer is beginning to study himself, his own form as conditioning the order and describability of phenomena. The next step was the theory of radioactivity, which again contains strong subjective elements and requires the calculus of probabilities to describe its results. The scientific picture of the world became ever more refined and ever more subjective. The formerly separate disciplines drew slowly together. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, epistemology, logic. Organic ideas intruded, showing once more that the observer had reached the point where he is studying the form of his own reason. A chemical element now has a lifetime, and the precise events of its life are unpredictable, indeterminate. The very unit of physical happening itself, the atom, which was still believed in as a reality by the 19th century, became in the 20th century a mere concept the description of whose properties was constantly changed to meet and prop up technical developments. 
Formerly, every experiment merely showed the truth of the ruling theories. That was in the days of the supremacy of science as a discipline over technics, its adopted child. But, before the middle of the 20th century, every new experiment brought about a new hypothesis of atomic structure. What was important in the process was not the hypothetical house of cards which was erected afterwards, but the experiment which had gone before. No compunction was felt about having two theories, irreconcilable with one another, to describe the structure of the atom, or the nature of light. The subject matter of all the separate sciences could no longer be kept mathematically clear. Old concepts like mass, energy, electricity, heat, radiation, merged into one another, and it became ever more clear that what was really under study was the human reason, in its epistemological aspect, and the Western soul in its scientific aspect. Scientific theories reached the point where they signified nothing less than the complete collapse of science as a mental discipline. The picture was projected of the Milky Way as consisting of more than a million fixed stars, among which are many with a diameter of more than 93 million miles. This again is not a stationary cosmic center, but itself in motion toward nowhere at a speed of more than 600 kilometers a second. The cosmos is finite, but unlimited, boundless, but bounded. This demands of the true believer the old Gothic faith again, credo quia absurdum. But mechanical purposelessness cannot evoke this kind of faith, and the high priests have apostatized. In the other direction, the atom has equally fantastic dimensions. A ten millionth of a millimeter is its diameter, and the mass of a hydrogen atom stands to the mass of a gram of water, as the mass of a postcard stands to the mass of Earth. But this atom consists of electrons, the whole making up a sort of solar system, in which the distances between the planets is as great, in proportion to their mass, as in our solar system. The diameter of an electron is one three billionth of a millimeter. But the closer it is studied, the more spiritual it becomes. For the nucleus of the atom is a mere charge of electricity, having neither weight, volume, inertia, nor any other classic properties of matter. In its last great saga, science dissolved its own psychical foundations and moved outside the world of the senses into the world of the soul. Absolute time was dissolved and time became a function of position. Mass became spiritualized into energy. The idea of simultaneity was discarded. Motion became relative. Parallels cut one another. Two distances could no longer be said absolutely to equal one another. Everything which had once been described by, or had itself described, the word reality, dissolved in the last act of the drama of science as a mental discipline. The custodians of science as a mental discipline, one after another, abandoned the old materialistic positions. In the last act, they came to see that the science of a given culture has as its real object the description, in scientific terms, of the world of that culture. A world which again is the projection of the soul of that culture. The profound knowledge was realized through the very study of matter itself, and matter is only the envelope of the soul. To describe matter is to describe oneself, even though the mathematical equations drape the process with an apparent objectivity. Mathematics itself has succumbed as a description of reality. Its proud equations are only tautology. An equation is an identity, a repetition, and its truth is a reflection of the paper logic of the identity principle. But this is only a form of our thinking. The transition from 19th century materialism to the new spirituality of the 20th century was thus not a battle, but an inevitable development. This keen, ice-cold, mental discipline turned the knife on itself because of an inner imperative to think in a new way, an anti-materialistic way. Matter cannot be explained materialistically. Its whole significance derives from the soul. Imperium Chapter 12, Section 3 Materialism from this standpoint appears as a great negative. It was a great spiritual effort to deny the spirit, and this denial of the spirit was in itself an expression of a crisis in the spirit. It was the civilization crisis, the denial of culture by culture. 
For the animals, that which appears, matter, is reality. The world of sensation is the world. But for primitive man, and a fortiori, for culture man, the world separates out into appearances and reality. Everything visible and tangible is felt as a symbol of something higher and unseen. This symbolizing activity is what distinguishes the human soul from the less complicated life forms. Man possesses a metaphysical sense as the hallmark of his humanity. But it is precisely the higher reality, the world of symbols, of meaning and purpose, that materialism denied in toto. What was it then but the great attempt to animalize man by equating the world of matter with reality and merging him into it? Materialism was not overcome because it was false. It simply died of old age. It is not false even now. It merely falls on deaf ears. It is old-fashioned and has become the worldview of country cousins. With the collapse of its reality, Western science as a mental discipline has accomplished its mission. Its byproduct, science as a world outlook, now belongs to yesterday. But as one of the results of the Second World War, there appeared a new stupidity. Technics worship as a philosophy of life and the world. Technics has in its essence nothing to do with science as a mental discipline. It has one aim, the extraction of physical power from the outer world. It is, so to speak, nature politics, as distinguished from human politics. The fact that technics proceeds on one hypothesis today and on another tomorrow shows that its task is not the formation of a knowledge system, but the subjecting of the outer world to the will of Western man. The hypotheses that it proceeds on have no real connection with its results, but merely afford points of departure for the imagination of technicians to think along new lines for new experiments to extract ever more power. Some hypotheses are of course necessary. Precisely what they are is secondary. Technics is even less capable than science, then, of satisfying the need for a world outlook to this age. Physical power? For what? The age itself supplies the answer. Physical power for political purposes. Science has passed into the role of furnishing the terminology and ideation for technics. Technics, in turn, is the servant of politics. Ever since 1911, the idea of atomic energy has been in the air. But it was the spirit of war which first gave this theory a concrete form, with the invention, in 1945, by an unknown Westerner of a new high explosive which depends for its effect on the instability of atoms. Technics is practical. Politics is sublimely practical. It has not the slightest interest in whether a new explosive is referred to atoms, electrons, cosmic rays, or to saints and devils. The historical way of thinking which informs the true statesman cannot take today's terminology too seriously when he remembers how quickly yesterday's was dropped. A projectile which can destroy a city of 200,000 persons in a second, that, however, is a reality and affects the sphere of political possibilities. It is the spirit of politics which determines the form of war, and the form of war then influences the conduct of politics. Weapons, tactics, strategy, the exploitation of victory, all these are determined by the political imperative of the age. Each age forms the entirety of its expression for itself. Thus, to the form-rich 18th century, warfare also was a strict form, a sequence of position and development, like the contemporary musical form of variations on a theme. An odd aberration occurred in the Western world after the first employment of a new high explosive in 1945. Essentially, it was referable to remnants of materialistic thinking, but there were also perennially old mythological ideas in it. The idea arose that this new explosive would blow up the whole planet. In the middle of the 19th century, when the railway idea was projected, the medical doctors said that such swift motion would generate cerebral troubles, and that even the sight of a train rushing past might do so. Furthermore, the sudden change of air pressure in tunnels might cause strokes. The idea of the planet blowing up was just another form of the old idea, found in many mythologies, Western and non-Western, of the end of the world, Ragnarok, Gotodamarung, Cataclysm. 
Science also picked up this idea and wrapped it up as the second law of thermodynamics. The Technics worshippers fancied many things about the new explosive. They did not realize that it was no end of a process, but the beginning. We stand at the beginning of the age of absolute politics, and one of its demands is naturally for powerful weapons. Therefore, Technics is ordered to strain after absolute weapons. It will never attain them, however, and any belief that it will stamps its possessor as simply a materialist, which is to say, in the 20th century, a provincial. Technics worship is completely inappropriate to the soul of Europe. The formative impulse of human life does not come from matter now any more than it ever did. On the contrary, the very way of experiencing matter and the way of utilizing it are expressions of the soul. The naive belief of Technics worship that an explosive is going to remake Western civilization from its foundations is a last dying gasp of materialism. This civilization made this explosive, and it will make others. They did not make it, nor will they ever make or unmake the Western civilization. No more than matter created the Western culture can it ever destroy it. It is still materialism to confuse a civilization with factories, homes, and the collectivity of installations. Civilization is a higher reality, manifesting itself through human populations, and within these, through a certain spiritual stratum, which embodies at highest potential the living idea of the culture. This culture creates religions, forms of architecture, arts, states, nations, races, peoples, armies, wars, poems, philosophies, sciences, weapons, and inner imperatives. All of them are mere expressions of the higher reality, and none of them can destroy it. The attitude of the 20th century towards science and technics is clear. It does not ask them to furnish a world outlook. This it derives elsewhere. And it positively rejects any attempt to make a religion or a philosophy out of materialism or atom worship. It does, however, have use for them, in the service of its unlimited will to power. The idea is primary, and in actualizing it, superiority in weapons is essential in order to compensate for the immense numerical superiority of the enemies of the West.